Morning. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, what we're going to do now is to have a, a whistle-stop uh, coverage of a whole range of topics, just to give you an overview of what's been happening in the rhino world since last year. But first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, the co-authors on the most recent uh, um, joint IUCN traffic report to CITES, uh, who are listed there. Um, some of the information and tables that I'll be presenting are in this document, and if you want to download it, if you just Google for COP17 slash 68 slash A4, uh, A5 rather, I sh you will get the document. So it's that uh, COP17 slash 68 A4. So we're going to whistle through an, a range of topics, not really going to read them out here. Let's get started, first of all, with what's happened with rhino numbers and poaching in Africa. The good news is that while poaching has increased at the continental level for the sixth consecutive year in a row, we've seen a marked slowing in the rate of increase of poaching over the last two years, and especially over last year, which you can see here with only a slight increase in poaching uh, in 2015. But one thing you can also notice is that the black rhino poaching, which is shown in the dark, uh, the dark black, has increased. And that's partly because there was more black rhinos poached in Kruger last year, and at the same time, there are also increases of poaching in, of black rhinos in Namibia and Zimbabwe. Um, this slowing of the rate in, of increase has very significant implications to how rhino numbers might go in the future, so it's very good news. Um, if we're looking at the South African story, um, the pictures here, the, the black bars on the left show you by calendar year, and the grey bars on the right show you by trailing 12 months up to the end of April. And um, that's showing a similar trend, but with an encouraging um, slight drop-off in poaching recently. And uh, the latest statistics released by the government are produced 702 by the end of August, so that's two-thirds of the way through the year. And if we simply extrapolate that, then we should be around about 125 less than we had last year. But uh, in a lot of years, apart from last year, often around November and towards the end of the year, there can be a spike in poaching. So we'll have to see whether this, this uh, progress can be maintained. Um, the trends have been variable. Poaching's declined in Kenya for the last two years, and it, as I showed there, it's declined in South Africa in 2015. And there was even a very slight reported drop in Kruger. But it's been cancelled out by increases in poaching in Namibia and Zimbabwe, and there's also been geographic shifts within countries. For example, uh, we've seen an increased spillover in, in, into KZN. And even with this drop in poaching increase, the current levels of uh, recorded poaching as a percentage of the rhino numbers last year were 5.3% for white and 3.8% per black. And it's not, it's just only a little bit below the kind of levels of the underlying natural population growth rates that we experienced from 1995 until uh, the poaching um, started to kick, to tick up, kick off in a big way in 2008. So we can't withstand too much more increases, but so certainly the, the sort of leveling off is, at, 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 at happened now is to be welcomed. Um, there are possible implications of the increased militarization of poaching, and although we don't have time to go into it today and other speakers will follow, there is an increasing recognition of the need for improved relationships with and greater incentivized participation of communities uh, in conservation as part of the long-term um, solution. If we're looking at the numbers, uh, we see a situation for white rhino continentally where numbers have stabilized uh, recently at around about 20,000. Uh, numbers have been down over the last three years by 0.4% per year, but doing some bootstrapping, this is unlikely to be statistically significant, so all we can say is they've leveled off. In terms of the black rhino, um, numbers have still continued to increase at a continental level. Uh, that was significant, but it slowed a little bit. And from 2012 to 15, we're probably looking at a 2.9% per annum increase. I uh, don't expect you to read the table, but it's in that document. Again, if you Google the, uh, the, the letters in yellow, you'll find it. 
But the key thing is South Africa remains the really big player with 79% of African rhinos. And the big four countries, if you include Namibia, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, uh, conserve 97.5%. Now, these figures are for the end of 2015. And using some bootstrapping, we came up with some confidence levels, 90% confidence levels, that we think the white rhinos are somewhere between uh, just under 19,700 uh, 19, up to 21,000, and the black rhinos are from about 5,000 to about 5,450-odd. If we look at the breakdown, the top two uh, um, pies there are showing breakdown by country, with South Africa having 91% or so of the white rhinos and 37% of the, the black um, and the other big four countries. The bottom two pies show the uh, white uh, rhino and black rhino ownership, with the orange showing the state. So the state in, for both species is conserving about two-thirds, with the balance being made up from either private sector in blue or um, a black rhino in particular, there was probably 6% on community land. A slight difference in terms of with the white rhino and private land, as you know, they're largely privately owned, but the majority of black rhino are generally under some form of custodianship arrangement. Okay, what's been happening at Kruger, who that's obviously borne the brunt of the poaching, but it's also got most of the rhinos. Um, they've had many initiatives, including um, creating an IPZ in the south where most of the rhinos are. They've got uh, a, a, a big new uh, high-tech ops center where they can control operations. Uh, the technology managed to be improved with a whole lot of um, initiatives funded through a Howard Buffett Foundation grant. And uh, there's also been increased effort, and there's been some strategic translocations of some animals to safer locations elsewhere. Uh, in, and in currently this year, poaching is down with uh, the first eight months, 458 compared to 557. Now, that 18% reduction in poaching in Kruger so far this year um, is has been achieved despite the fact that the number of incursions have actually gone up by 28%. So the guys have been just getting more efficient at actually uh, getting to the, the poachers quicker, um, and, but it, it, there's clearly no sign of demand slowing. And some um, bootstrap analysis indicated that it's in most probable that white and black rhino numbers are now lower in Kruger than they were in 2012. Encouragingly, there's been increasing cooperation of Mozambique, which is helping. And we've seen a geographic shift from poaching along the eastern edge of uh, Kruger, bound, uh, bordering Mozambique, to shifting to the west and also elsewhere in other countries and elsewhere in the country. In terms of trade, what's been happening? Um, this table you can look up, there's more detail available in the report, but um, we tried to put together for the CITES report uh, an approximation, obviously it's, it is just that, an approximation of roughly how many horns were possibly being attempted to be sourced for the international trade from a range of different sources. And by far the bulk, almost 91%, was coming from poached rhinos. If we looked at a previous problem area, which was the pseudo-hunting, which in the past used to account for about 20% of the sourced horn, that now is only accounting for 2.3%, and I'll, I'll cover that just now. If we look at this, these graphs are showing for different periods the average number of horns being criminals have tried to move annually um, in different pre-CITES COP reporting periods. And you can see there's been just a steady increase uh, up to uh, a bit over 2,500 horns per year uh, in the run-up to the last COP. And the reason why it's so uh, important that we managed and we're starting to see the uh, rate of poaching increase sort of leveling off is this is the dotted line to the right is showing you what would have happened if the trend I just showed you in the last graph were to continue until the next CITES COP. We'd be up to about 4,700 uh, horns per year instead of two and a half. So it, it's really quite critical, the, the, um, you know, what we've seen now. 
Um, as I mentioned, there's been a shift in the, the in declining um, importance of the pseudo-hunting. Um, but this was a trend even before South Africa introduced a number of measures in 2012. The rate of increase in poaching was increasing at a higher rate that Tom Mulliken found than the, um, the, 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 the pseudo-hunting was. And it's probably because there were higher margins for the criminals. Um, other things that traffic identified in our joint report, um, they looked at over 300 seizures globally to try and identify relative rhino horn trade flows. Um, and not surprisingly, South Africa is the major source of, of poached horn um, was at the top of the list. But also this was followed by Mozambique, which is one of the major countries where horn's been flowing through. In terms of destination countries, Vietnam, um, which has been on the radar since 2006, continues to uh, be the leading country of import. And one of the things that's been found recently is that um, since the previous CITES meeting, um, there's been a sort of change in that there's more and more varied quality products in terms of carvings, for example, combs or bowls or other things uh, coming onto the market in Vietnam. Uh, and there's more use of, of horn as, as uh, luxury, luxury uh, goods. Also, more indication that horn may be used as, as, a, as an investment. Um, the, it was an interesting paper in, uh, that compared uh, how the Western media was about 80% of the reports were focusing on, on medicinal uses of horn. But if you went and looked at, at the Chinese media, what was written in Chinese, most of it was actually looking at rhino horn as high value goods and uh, as possible investments. So it, uh, there are different markets. One of the things that's come out is that China has really emerged as another important destination country for rhino horn, and that's despite it having banned trade since 1993, and actually acting and having a number of rhino horn seizures and a number of court cases with some quite significant sentences being handed down. Now, China is a bit different from Vietnam is that it seems to be now that the physical markets with horn in them are pretty rare and that what seems to have happened, and they've also shut down a lot of the obvious auctioning of antique uh, rhino horn artifacts. And what things have gone a bit more underground in terms of the internet, in terms of the dark web, and also on private social media platforms. So it's providing a law enforcement challenge. Um, but one um, and Lao PDR and Myanmar are also a problem. Well, what's happening in Asia? Uh, numbers of greater one-horned rhino continue to increase. They're up to just a bit over three and a half thousand. Uh, as we've reported at previous years, the, the bulk of them are in India, just over 2,900. And again, about 80% of those are in one population, Kazaranga, in uh, Assam. Uh, numbers in Nepal are now up to 645 odd, um, and they are mostly in one part Chitwan. And what's encouraging is that the numbers have now recovered and exceeded the 2,000 total of 612, which was before serious poaching took off at the time of the civil unrest and the Maoist rebellion, which ended up causing numbers of, of rhinos in the country to drop by a third from uh, by 2008. So in Nepal, Nepal's had some really um, good success. Um, this is just a graph showing you uh, how the poaching numbers, um, generally very low. If we looked at overall the levels of poaching of the greater one-horned rhino, it's only 0.7%, which we can compare with 5.3% of the white rhino per annum, as opposed to 3.8% for blacks. So. Um, and in Nepal, uh, they've only had two rhinos poached from 2011 to 2016. What's happened with the Sumatran rhino, through, largely through neglect and lack of effort um, uh, and habitat transformation, it's now uh, extinct in the wild in Malaysia, uh, both in Borneo and in Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, four of the Borneo subspecies was, was found um, in Kalimantan quite recently, but sadly one out of those were, was killed during a, a botched um, immobilization. 
Um, the main hope is for possibly up to 373, but that's a fairly ropey figure. Um, but it's a bit more realistic than some of the past figures, I think. Um, but there's far fewer Sumatran rhinos than previously thought. The monitoring is still inadequate, although it's improved a little bit in some areas. Um, and some of the subpopulations are a little bit small with, with twos and threes and fives. And so there may be a need to consolidate uh, some animals. Um, there are discussions about setting up an IPZ, but there's still a general underinvestment in conservation effort. Um, there was a, sec a second captive bred calf uh, last year, but in general, if you looked over in the longer term, while there have been two calves recently, it, it hasn't been a, a major success. The Javan rhino, the good news is the numbers, the estimated numbers are now up to 73. There have been some calves, but part of this increase is just due to the fact that they've got more camera traps that cover the whole park now. So they've actually got a, a, better, a better monitoring system. So part of it is just a, a virtue of, of a better estimate. They're still in one population, which is not strategically sound. If one of the big volcanoes goes off or they have a tsunami, but there's still just talk, and there's been talk for two decades about setting up a second population. But there has been some successful habitat uh, measures where they controlled some alien plants and some indigenous plants grew up, <laughs> and the rhinos then moved into those areas and browsed on them. So that was encouraging. In terms of hunting, um, these two figures are showing you, the blue is showing you when hunting started with white rhino on the left uh, and uh, the quotas for black rhino in South Africa and Namibia on the right. So you can see in both cases the start of hunting hasn't really coincided with a, a massive crash of the rhino numbers. Obviously more recently the poaching is starting to have an impact on overall numbers. Now, in terms of pseudo-hunting, which you've probably he heard about in, in previous years, the graph on the left shows the numbers of white rhino uh, hunted in South Africa per year. And you can see there was a steady and rapid increase up to 2011. Early in 2012, South Africa took a number of measures to address the pseudo-hunting issue. And you can see from that point onwards, numbers have crashed back down again to more normal levels. And that partly explains why the issue is not as big as it once was. Uh, by comparison, the numbers hunted in Namibia, the other hunting country, are shown on the right, but very, very small. If we look at black rhino, again, tiny numbers being hunted, and South Africa's only hunted its full quota in three out of the 11 years, and Namibia never has. The most Namibia's ever hunted in any, any, any year is two. So very small. If we looked at what was the effect of the measures South Africa took in 2012, I did a comparison. The gray is showing you the number of hunting applications per year uh, before South Africa took the measures up to in the three-year period 2009 to 2011. Uh, sorry, sorry, the black. The black is showing you what happened before. So if you look at the top, there were huge numbers, over 100 applications per year by Vietnamese. Uh, then South Africa took some measures, and then they've also now sort of stopped issuing permits to Vietnamese citizens and Czechs. And you can see from Vietnam, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Thailand, there was a massive decline. There have been an increase in some other countries like China. Uh, in part, that's, that will probably be due to just increasing popularity of hunting and marketing. But it's quite possible that maybe increases in Slovakia, Ukraine, there's some kind of proxy hunting going on in the same way as it happened with the Czech Republic. But still, even if a, a, a certain proportion of the hunts are um, going that way, it's, it's small in the big picture of things. In terms of CITES, um, Swaziland, you're probably aware, put forward a, uh, a downlisting proposal at the COP. Um, if anyone's interested, maybe at T, you could discuss a bit more of the debate. You don't really have time now to go into the details. But um, the debate, there were really quite polarized views being expressed with both sides trying to argue their case. Um, the case was made in terms of from those supporting protectionism uh, as opposed to those who supported conservation with sustainable use. 
um, some the, the potential of demand reduction, uh, some thinking it was the panacea that was going to save everything, and others saying, well, we've had demand reduction for 40 years. Is it going to work? Uh, and then there were questions as to whether or not any trade might influence the possible success of demand reduction. Um, there was debate as to whether CITES has worked or not worked with differing views and the importance of communities and incentives and how to pay for conservation was, was argued quite strongly for those in favour. Um, and But control, the concerns were mentioned about uh, controls and laundering if trade were not properly um, controlled. And um, also, there were concerns raised about the lack of detail in this proposal, which was put forward at a very last minute, because Swaziland were expecting South Africa to put forward a proposal, and the week before South Africa announced the deadline, South Africa announced they weren't going to put a proposal, so Swaziland wanted the, the issue up for debate and very quickly put together a proposal, but the, there was insufficient detail to really assess in terms of who were they going to trade with. Uh, how, how would it work, who, who would pay for it, and so on. The vote was by secret ballot. Um, as was expected, it failed to get the two-thirds majority, which is necessary at a COP to pass. Um, it was rejected by 100, but with the EU voting as a bloc. So although some countries within the EU, if they could have voted on their own, indicated to Swaziland they would have voted in favor, their vote was just cast with all the other um, EU countries. Um, so there were 100 uh, votes uh, against the proposal. It was supported by 27 and 17 abstentions. And based on interventions by many of the Southern African rain states and SADC pre-COP discussions, uh, it was probable that the countries conserving almost 97% of Africa's rhinos actually voted in favor of Swaziland's proposal, although they ended up on the, the losing side, as it were, um, with Kenya, Botswana, and Uganda opposing. At the standing committee, there were two standing committee meetings either side of the COP, and at the COP, uh, Vietnam in particular came in for uh, some quite strong criticism, especially for its limited law enforcement efforts, its continued and repeated failure to provide proper information on, in terms of its arrests, convictions, and sentences, uh, the new penal code that was supposed to have tough new penalties uh, has been delayed, um, and really, patience was beginning to wear thin. Um, there had been more progress with Mozambique, but more needs to be done. Both countries have been set some reporting requirements, and in particular, possibly potentially, the failure of Vietnam to respond adequately from now on uh, may well open the way for compliance measures that CITES to follow if, if they continue to fail to provide the information requested. And one of the things in previous uh, times is China has not been on the reporting radar, but one of the recommended decisions to come out of the COP was to consider the recommendations in our joint report and specifically mentioning the identification of countries for priority attention, which includes China. So they were likely to be very much part of the radar and hopefully can assist and be part of the solution. The CITES Rhino Working Group mandate was extended and there are also lots of side events. Um, I'm just very briefly going to touch on this, uh, uh, that um, within South Africa, there's been a development of a national integrated strategy to combat wildlife trafficking. So that's uh, called NISQUIT, uh, <laughs> as a short acronym, uh, and there's also been a rhino lab process. And part of this has come about because it's been felt that sometimes we've had the wrong people round the table in terms of we've had security people. Uh, we, ha we, we haven't had the security people and we're actually dealing with transnational organized crime. Uh, the conservationists have stepped up to the plate, but we've had conservationists negotiating MOUs, but really if it's to do with something to do with law enforcement in the different countries, it really needs the law enforcement authorities in those countries. So it's partly a paradigm shift in also recognizing we're not just dealing here with poaching or a conservation issue, this is an issue of national security and we really need to be looking at trafficking and looking the whole way up the trade chain. 
uh, not just focusing on the poachers, but really trying to disrupt what are effectively businesses. So that requires a multi-sectoral approach with all different arms of government working together. And this new Nisquit strategy is going to be led by um, the SAPs. Uh, and it's in the final stages of being authorized with cooperation from all other arms of government. And also, um, Lyle Pino, one of the um, security analysts for the South African government who spoke at a side event, um, he also um, emphasized the importance of increased international cooperation against wildlife crime because that can achieve results. That's also recognized in the new uh, Conservation Action Plan. Uh, but the, his, his key, one of his key messages that we, we really need to have a sort of paradigm shift and look at it as trafficking at all um, parts of the trade and, um, and to have it led by law enforcement. In terms of red listing, uh, the red listing, the regional red listing has been redone uh, for African rhinos. It is available on, on the internet. Um, there's been no change in terms of the white rhino. It still uh, is classified as uh, it will be cla it's classified it um, as near threatened, the same as the continental uh, rating. But one of the things that's interesting, we, there are a number of quite a number of technical issues that we had to deal with in order to do this analysis. And one of them is that uh, it makes sense, given the heavy poaching that was done, what one projects a bit into the future um, what might what might happen um, with poaching. And the question is, what kind of poaching to model? And as I showed earlier, the trends in poaching have changed over the last few years from a very rapid increase to leveling off. And in terms of the white rhino case, um, if we were looking at uh, the on the left-hand column, uh, that, that's showing if there was 100% detection in Kruger. In other words, the reported figures are, are the true numbers. Um, we start with about 18,500. Um, if we based um, on a range of different poaching scenarios, but looking fi at five-year trend and modeling that, we get a bit of a decline to 16,300 odd. But on the other hand, if we model the trend over the last year, the last 12 months up to April, we get an increase up to 22,700. So the, the, the change in poaching has quite big implications in terms of what's happening with the white rhino numbers. Um, but either way, the, these numbers come nowhere near the critical threshold values they would have to pass. Um, these are, are projections five years into the future because it was felt unreasonable. And in general, with most things, our ability to predict more than five years into the future becomes exceedingly ropey, and we can't, uh, really not really justified in doing that. In terms of the red listing for the other species, um, we have got uh, the black rhino is uh, endangered now, uh, not critically endangered, and that's part. Oh. Uh, not not uh, not critically endangered, and that's because there's been a certain number of um, of adult animals in the popular in, in, in for over five years. Um, the two more common subspecies in in the region, that's South Africa and Swaziland, are endangered. With um, the DB Michaeli, the one population out of range is critically endangered because it's so small. Uh, an African rhino rain states conservation plan has been developed. Uh, there was participation of all 11 rhino rain states. It's not trying to uh, replace the national plans, which are below, where most of the detail from day-to-day -day, uh, um, strategies are covered on. But the continental plan just provides an umbrella, and it focuses on areas of cooperation and collective action. Um, it's a fairly standard approach um, with a five-year goal and some illustrative actions and KPIs. But it's really focusing on highlighting the areas that needs continental collaboration. Um, the vision, I'm not going to read it, read it, you can read, uh, but we felt that with the high levels of poaching, uh, a realistic goal is if we could manage to just get continental rhino numbers to increase over the next five years, we'd be doing well. 
In terms of the key components um, that were identified as important in the, in the continental plan, we had protection and law enforcement unsurprisingly coming out top. But very close behind, having adequate finance was, was, was critical, as was coordination and the biological management and monitoring to get rhinos growing at a rapid rate was also recognized as incredibly important. So, but all the different pillars that were identified, and most of these are in the different national plans, uh, were scored very highly. The plan itself is a sort of typical plan with a goal in the middle. There's a number of different key components in the, shown by the green boxes. Each of them has an objective and then the, the actions and key performance indicators. But uh, the, the items in, in red are just going to very quickly fly through this, highlighting the areas where there's the continental cooperation and international cooperation is needed. So strengthen cooperative law enforcement actions cooperative intelligence sharing and analysis across countries, um, expanding populations across range states uh, for biological management, increased coordination, active participation in forums, range expansion, um, socioeconomic largely dealt with nationally, political support, there were, uh, parts, there were elements of the plan to try and get higher level political support continentally. Um, communication was an issue. Capacity, again, best dealt with nationally, and financing mechanisms and structures were identified with a number of cross-cutting issues. Um, but the RAIN states will be uh, accountable for implementing the plan, and um, they should use national coordinator if it is possible. Um, some uh, national and continental priority projects are to be identified, and investigative uh, uh, um, alternative financing mechanisms such as Rhino Impact Investing are to be invested, uh, investigated, as would be the potential value of setting up an African Rhino Fund. And there are KPIs for each of the key components to assess it and evaluate it. In terms of the largest captive breeding operation, uh, in this case, John Hume's in. Uh, um, operation. Um, the reason I've got some fruit there is that both of these are fruit, but, um, but they differ. In the same way a zoo differs from uh, this kind of semi-wild, um, much more ex extensive uh, system that we're looking at here. I reported before that, um, that this particular operation was getting a 9.75% per annum growth rate. And even when you, you, you looked at parameters that w weren't affected by sex ratio, it was still, um, the breeding was, was, was still good to excellent. Um, but one of the things that we found um, was that uh, we were concerned that potentially animals could, um, if they were, grew up eating supplementary food with high levels of phytoestrogens like lucerne, maybe it might affect their reproductive development and their calving rate. So this was a potential concern. Could there be an F1 problem? Uh, it's too early to really look at F1s inside this particular captive breeding operation, but some of the animals came from the owner's previous operation where they were at higher densities with supplementary feeding, and it was found that uh, that didn't have an effect. But you may be interested that we did find that the age class that you introduced the White Rhino Act had an impact on the calving rate in that you got the worst performance, uh, calving performance when you introduced sub-adults, the best when it came in as calves with adults uh, doing okay. And the other effect that we found uh, was that there was a settling in effect in terms of it took about four years until calving sort of plateaued uh, at, uh, at, at its maximum rate. Um, so it turned out the F1 was not really a, a problem, and there have been a number of calves born uh, to um, some ex-Morrisdale-born -Mor cows. Uh, finally, the RODIS DNA system, uh, that continues to be, provide a valuable role in providing forensic DNA evidence for court cases. There's a need to get more routine samples and, and more um, profiles into the database. But there was an important international workshop that was held recently, um, and apart from people getting a chance to use the kits and, and the apps for, for collecting the data in the field in the, at a crime scene in Kruger, uh, a major output of the workshop was it set up the requirements of a, simplif a simplified and improved validated 
um, RODIS system um, to facilitate the sharing and rollout of uh, an improved compatible system to multiple labs across the world with a, within the hope that this is going to become the international standard capable of producing compatible DNA profiles which can be stored in a single global database. And India's in the process of setting up a lab. Uh, and other than that, I'd just like to, to finish off by saying thanks to both the Rain States, the co-authors I, I, I showed earlier, and, and the reviewers, and we have a number of, of, of um, partners who help support us either holding the meetings where we can collect uh, some of this data uh, or help, help support the work. Um, and if any of you are interested, didn't have time to really go into demand reduction, but we can chat at tea. Thank you.